Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, learners, wherever you are. Welcome to our Speak to a Scientist program event that we are broadcasting this afternoon from the Saibono Broadcasting Studio. I'm sure everyone who's watching this is very happy and excited to be with us to our Speak to a Scientist program. And many of you might not know what is Speak to a Scientist, but today I'll definitely explain to you what is Speak to a Scientist and why you have joined. I know we are joined by people from <coughs> different platforms, our Twitter, our Facebook pages, you know, others they are even WhatsApping others to say, hey, Kolani on Speak to a Scientist again at Saibono Broadcasting Studio. Speak to a Scientist program event, as you know it, guys, is our own platform whose objective is to provide an opportunity to understand theories, to develop uh, other theories around science, to provide an understanding for learners who might not understand certain uh, gigabytes ways that our teachers, our parents are giving at home. And today we want to, to make sure that as learners we understand what is it that we are doing every day at home, every day in school, to make sure that we give you a different perspective when it comes to theories around this program of Speak to a Scientist. Now, our aim is to even expose you as learners, even our clientele, wherever you are, to different perspectives and even to encourage you, you know, and to encourage growth in your understanding on certain concepts around science. Now, without wasting any time, I'll be your program director for this one hour around this Speak to a Scientist as Colan in America. Many of you have been joining our Speak to a Scientist, know me. Today, I'm joined by an expert who is from uh, the Food and Beverage Division. Uh, Makati Winnie Rasifudi. Winnie Rasifudi, she's a business manager in AECI Food and Beverage, AECI Limited. She has a career spanning 21 years in chemical manufacturing processes industry and has been with the AECI Limited Group since 2003. Wow! With a chemical engineering background, you know, technical sales and business management, She's passionate about problem solving, process troubleshooting, and <laughs> helping her clients with expertise in filtration. You see, these are the type of ways that I'm talking about. With her extensive experience, you know, Winnie Rasifudi in product application, technical test evaluations, and process in problem solving. After 20 years, her career in STEM has presented her with an opportunity far beyond her expectations, which is why I'm passionate, she is so passionate about passing on a button, you know, to other young females out there so that they can saturate in the field using as a stepping stone if they pursue their careers in beverages. Recently, she has discovered hiking as a way to center herself so in, in a, a chaotic, chaotic but, but yet, yet exciting, exciting career. career. That's, That's quite, quite lovely, lovely to, to say. say. At, At times, times, you need to know to be taking, taking sports and so on. And, and definitely, we have a climbing wall here that will assist Winnie as well in making sure that her hiking becomes, you know, as well a dream. Ladies and gentlemen, without wasting any time, please let's welcome uh, Makati Winnie Rasifudi to our studio. Winnie, how are you? I'm all right. Uh, I think in the language Winnie Rasifudi, that's a vendor. Yes, yes Makazi Wini Rasifudi. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, think in Venda we will greet you say Dimatiara Abudi. Dimasiara. Dimasiara Abudi. Yes, Masiara Abudi. Okay, 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 that implies to you. <laughs> Good day. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I know I, like I got that. Welcome, Welcome to Saibono Discovery Center. And, and thank, thank you very much for honoring uh, the invitation and, and coming, coming to bless the learners for them to understand the expertise around food and beverages on a topic crystal clear solutions in food and beverages. I'm definitely, definitely sure, sure that, that learners will get a lot out of this because I would also, also want to know more about what is it that they are having for us on food and beverages. <laughs> Can we <laughs> not, without <laughs> any waste of time, get, get to that? I'm sure they are so appetizing to hear more from you. Okay, thank you very much for your invite. Yeah. Um, and, and good afternoon, afternoon to all the learners. Um, as, as introduced, my name is Makadzuini Rasifudi. Uh, my, uh, my topic, topic today, today is about, about crystal clear solutions in food and beverage. Now, this is how my story begins. Uh, that is my grandmother, 
Gugu Mashamba, the scientist. Now, if you look at her in a beautiful lime hat, she doesn't look much like a scientist. Uh, there's a picture of a fight duke, what we call a fight duke, traditionally at home, but it's a typical uh, dish cloth. And then there's also some ginger beer. Recording in progress. So if we so chat, around chat around crystal clear solutions, now you're wondering, what does my grandmother, the dish cloth and the ginger beer has to do? Um, this is a concept of me explaining solid liquid separation. Now, traditionally, if you have functions, your grandmother might prepare ginger beer, which they will typically ferment. And then from there on, they will then remove the yeast out of the ginger beer, typically by filtering through a cloth, which is the traditional way that they would do it. And then you will have a crystal clear solution, which is a ginger beer that you will then, um, you will then drink for your function. So what is filtration? Uh, filtration is basically a, a process of solid liquid separation where you would pass something, uh, whether a liquid or a gas will pass through a filter. Now there's some typical examples on there. If you think about a fan or a, a motor filter, if you put on your aircon in your car, it's actually air filtration. Uh, if you think about you making coffee in your kitchen, you will normally would put a filter paper and then you'll pour your coffee over. You actually are conducting filtration. Uh, if you use a jug um, with filtered water, what you call filtered water, your kidneys, um, they filter out toxins from your system. They clean out your blood. It's all methods of filtration. Um, if you look back maybe three or four years ago, all of us were wearing masks to protect ourselves, uh, the masks were actually filtering the air for us so that we don't get germs in our systems during COVID. All of that, it's all part of filtration. Now, I'll give you some examples, everyday examples. If you think about fruit juices, if you go to the shop and you're buying an apple juice, it looks crystal clear. It actually has been filtered. If you think of where apple juice comes from, they have to clarify it. And that's why it looks the color that it does. If you think about sunflower oil, when you go to a shop and you wanna buy sunflower oil, it looks very golden yellow. Haven't you ever wondered why does it look that color from a sunflower? It's actually through processes of clarification and filtration. The same goes for alcoholic beverages. In this case is beer. Because if you think about, if you use hops and you use malt, it's actually solids that are suspended in the beer after fermentation. So you actually have to filter it out. There's different industries that we actually would apply the concept of filtration. It could be chemicals. Uh, if you think about a process of producing, um, you're producing um, some sort of an acid, there will be a chemical reaction sometimes there will be suspended solids in there so you're gonna have to remove it the dry cleaners when you take your jacket to go clean it at the dry cleaners there's actually a system of filtration at the back because they actually reuse the solution believe it or not the same solution that washed my jacket was filtered and was reused to wash yours then i've already spoken about the breweries um the glucose in the mining industry, gold recovery, platinum. So it's a wide range of filtration applications. So the reason I highlight all of this is for you to bear in mind in everyday life, you might not be aware of it, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. You are definitely filtering with everything that we use. So what are the different types of filtration? My first slide, actually showed my grandmother. Could any of you think of what my grandmother was actually doing? She was actually performing gravitational filtration. She was taking a ginger beer, putting it over the cloth and just letting it run. She was not squeezing it. She was not doing anything to it, but she was actually letting gravity take its course. And that is the typical um, type of filtration you will use in a domestic setting. 
However, you can also imagine how long something like that will take. How many cloths you probably have to change for you to be able to get a clear solution on there. If you think about when we have a party, they will typically have different buckets with different, different cloths for them to try and make sure that you do have at least 25 liters for the whole family to enjoy ginger beer. Typically in industry, we actually use bigger pieces of equipment. Um, so you would do pressure filtration. Uh, pressure filtration, very self-explanatory. It means that you are conducting filtration by applying pressure. Now, if you look at that drum, it's actually um, a drum I took at one of the sites. It doesn't look very, very sightly. Um, it's because I was actually struggling with vacuum on there. Now, I'll explain when I um, further elaborate on how filtration works. So with vacuum filtration, think of a concept of a vacuum cleaner. It's very difficult for you maybe perhaps to clean up a shoe with your vacuum cleaner. It means that the, clue, the, the shoe is probably too big for the amount of vacuum that the vacuum cleaner is giving you. But it's, it's, it's a similar concept. So you need to think of it along those lines. And when I go further to explain how filtration works, you will then be able to connect the dots. So how does filtration work? We have what we call a feed. So what is a feed? Um, some might be thinking a feed is what we feed our cattle. Uh, in scientific terms, a feed is what you are going to filter. So it's basically whatever sort of liquid that contains contaminants that you are going to clear out. So that's what when they refer to a feed, that's what they would, um, um, they would be referring to. And then a filter will be either a vacuum filter or a pressure filter. There's also other different uh, modes of uh, filtration, depending on um, what application. Is it ultra filtration? Is it physical filtration or mechanical? And a filtrate, what you get at the end of the day after filtration, we call it a filtrate. So in other words, your crystal clear solution will then be what you call a filtrate. And for filtration to work, remember I gave you an example about my grandmother just letting a ginger beer run through the cloth and it's going to take her probably a couple of hours for her to get one liter of ginger beer. In industry or in food and beverage, you have to apply some sort of force. Now the previous slide, that type of force could either be pressure or vacuum. So that is typically how filtration works. Now I'll move on to a specific um, type of, in terms of filtration, we typically do physical or mechanical filtration and we would use something we call a filter aid. Now you're probably wondering, there's a beautiful picture there of a fruit juice and a pile of white powder. That is typically what a filter aid looks like. Uh, what is a filter aid? What does it do? Why do we need it if I already have a piece of equipment? So typically a filter aid is an agent um, that consists of solid particles. So if you think about the concept of the cloth that you're going to pour ginger beer over, that is typically what your filter aid is. It is aiding infiltration. So we're running the feed through the cloth for you to be able to get a crystal clear solution. What else does a filter aid do? It aids in um, filtering efficiency. Remember I explained my grandmother might change cloth one, cloth two, cloth three, because there is no filter aid, meaning that a cloth after some time of accumulating solids, it will probably blind. If it's blinded, it means she's no longer getting any clear solution at the bottom which means that the efficiency of that gravitational filtration is not sufficient. And one of the properties of a filter aid is it needs to be permeable. It sounds like a fancy word, but permeable just basically means going through. It needs to be able to allow the liquid to go through. And because it's a powder, it will form a rigid structure on a filter, which is what we call a filter cake. And the key function of a filter aid is for it to retain solids. 
similar to the Faiduk, which retains whatever yeast you get from your ginger beer, that is what your filter aid will do. At the same time, it also allows for flow to continue. Remember, if you don't have a filter aid, you're most likely to blind the cloth, meaning as time goes on and the hours go through, you are not going to get any final um, liquid at the end. And one of the most fascinating thing about it is particle sizes. It comes in various different particle sizes. Now I'll give you an example. If you are filtering stones and sticks and anything that you can think of that's of a bigger particle, would you use a very, 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 very fine uh, filter aid? That doesn't sound very logical. It means that if you are filtering bigger particles, you most likely to use a bigger type, a bigger particle size type of filter aid. Now I'll give you some examples with regards to what are the typical uh, filter aids that we have in industry. Obviously there's a wide range. I just took a snippet um, of an area that I can explain through to you guys. Um, we have what we call perlite. Now perlite is a volcanic rock. Now you're wondering how does filter aid and volcanic rock actually tie up together? So perlite many, many years ago, um, after a volcano has erupted, um, it actually, you have seen the lava, right? Uh, after it explodes, basically the lava runs down very quickly. It's very, very hot at very, very high temperatures. So you can imagine when it hits colder temperature, what happens? it immediately solidifies. It turns like a grayish, a grayish color of a stone and then it solidifies, which then basically means that because it quickly solidifies, it actually interrupts some, some moisture in the environment, which will mean you would mind that, you would put it through a furnace. Think about a concept of popcorn. You take a kernel of milli meal put in some oil and then you put it um, in a microwave and then it actually pops to like 10 or 15 times its size. That is typically how perlite is produced. If you think about a filter aid and it says perlite, think of the popcorn phenomenon. Then we'll then mill it to different particle sizes. And then another type of filter aid is diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is at the bottom of the sea, there's old remains of fossil, old plants, maybe perhaps people that might have lived a long time ago that have now at the bottom of the sea and they become fossils. They will then mine that and then into very fine particle sizes and then they also use it as a type of filter aid. The third one is actually cellulose. Cellulose, if you think cellulose, you think of trees, fiber trees. So they will actually take the pulp and then they will, they, it will go through different stages of clarification. Uh, they will bleach it. It will have different fiber lengths and then they will actually use it um, in terms of filtration. Now all these types of filter aids, they work at very specific industries. They all have different applications which is why you would choose one type of filter aid over the other um, if i give you for example one of the core um, particles in perlite it's actually very 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 it's chemically inert so if it's chemically inert it means that if you are filtering things like acids where you don't want any leaching to happen you would use an inorganic uh, filter aid like perlite and on the right hand side is just an example of different applications. Remember I spoke about different particle sizes. So if you think about um, you want to filter something that is very, very, it's a fine particle, which would mean that it's very, very slow. Start thinking of you want to filter things like greases, things with very, very high type of viscosity. You would use a medium type of filter aid maybe for juice clarification because it depends on the particle size that you're trying to remove. If you are filtering something like wine or sugar, something with very, very low concentration of solids, you would go for a faster filter aid. And then if you're filtering things like water or spirits, there's hardly any solids there. 
most of the solids that are there are actually dissolved. So you would go for a very super fast uh, filter aid. Now, why I'm telling you all of this about the different types of filter aid, it's actually an economical decision. If it takes my mother, my, my grandmother five hours to filter 25 liters of ginger beer, we can't have that in business. You can imagine how long something like that is going to take. So you would then need to use things like filter aid for you to be able to hasten that. Because if you are producing juice for somebody, I don't have to wait for my one liter of juice. I can't get it today. I can only get it in three or four weeks time. That is not being very economical or efficient for that matter. Now I've discussed the different types of filter aids. There's actually a scientific concept behind uh, filter aids and how they work. I promise you this is just one of the only formulas <laughs> I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to explain to you. Um, so in terms of um, filter aids, they're classified according to flow rates. Remember I, spoke, I said for the different applications, you're going to have either a fast or a slow or a super fast, um, depending on the permeability. Meaning that if it's very slow, it's got very, very fine particles. If it's very fast, it means that it's very porous. Your particle sizes are slightly bigger. So all of this and the permeability of a filter aid are actually classified by what we call Darcy's law. I don't know if any of you have actually come across Darcy's law. Um, so the Q stands for the volumetric flow rate. Um, you use this law for you to be able to classify what will be the most ideal filter aid grade for your process. So whatever flow rate this is now in the design stage in terms of process. You want to determine what filter aid would work for me filtering ginger beer, for instance, or filtering beer or waste water or wine or beer. You actually have to use this formula for you to determine what you're going to use. So as you're calculating how much volume is going to go through your medium, the area is very important. If my grandmother has tied that cloth over a little cup. It means that the surface area through which she's filtering, it's very small. So it means that the filtrate that she's going to get over a certain time period, it's not gonna be pretty much. So you will then calculate how much area I also need for me to be able to, for instance, get so much flow rate through my filter and the filter aid that I'm going to be using. The permeability of the medium. Um, so your permeability you are looking at, remember I discussed the different particle sizes, the more permeable, meaning that the more porous it is, the more flow rate you are going to get through your, um, through your filter. So if my grandmother did not use a cloth, for instance, and she used a sieve, a sieve is very, very open. It means that it's going to go through very, very quickly. That's how you relate the two concepts. And then viscosity. Um, you're wondering what viscosity is. Simply, it's a concept you're going to come across if you follow your STEM uh, subject all the way. Uh, viscosity is just determines how things flow. Um, think about if you look at syrup, what we call golden syrup. If you try to pour it out, it's very, very sticky, right? It's, it doesn't flow very, very, it means that it's something that has a very high viscosity. That is what viscosity is. If you look at water, for instance, it's very easy for you to pour out a glass of water. It doesn't quite need a whole lot of, it doesn't need heat for you to quicken it up or anything. And then pressure. Remember, one of the applications I spoke about is if you are filtering, you need some sort of force. So you will then calculate what your applied pressure is. And the thickness of your medium, it's also very, very important. So if you are filtering something through 25 layers of cloth, by the time the liquid gets through, it's a very thick medium for you to, to filter. It means it's going to take you a longer time period if your medium is very, very thick. But if you have one layer of cloth and you apply pressure on something, you are going to get um, the flow rate going through. 
So because I'm going to show you some, um, some pictures, um, just to clarify what some of the technical terms are. Um, so these are some terms you're going to come across in terms of filtration. There is something that they call a septum. So a septum is just basically a layer. It can either be, so the five duke I was referring to, that filter cloth is actually what they call a septum or a mesh in this instance. Um, if you look on the right hand uh, corner, I just did a close up of what a mesh looks like. This is what you typically get on a rotary drum filter. Remember I explained about vacuum filtration. So um, you will then put your filter aid on top of this mesh. So what are the practical applications of using a filter aid? Um, I'll start on the figure one. You're going to need some sort of flow. Remember we spoke about the feed. Um, if you have a filter, you are going to have number one, a layer of the filter aid. Remember the filter aid is the porous medium that's supposed to assist you for you to get to your final product very quickly is going to clarify and retains the solids. So you are going to have direction of flow and you're going to have your septum. Your septum will either be a mesh or it can be a cloth. If you go back to the ginger beer example, um, and then, so you're going to build a filter cake. This is what we call pre-coating. Um, pre-coating, if you're using a filter, the second picture under pressure filtration that I showed you, you will normally have a layer over your mesh. This is to protect your mesh, but it's also for it to trap the particulate matter you are going to remove. So under pressure, uh, if you look on figure two, you are going to apply some pressure to it through the filter aid. Then you can see the different, the black dots. It's actually what your particulate matter that you have removed that will remain on the surface of your filter aid. So this is in summary, it's how a filter aid works in industry. I've explained a lot of examples and a lot of what the different practical applications are. Um, and like any science concept, there's always a reason why certain things are done, especially in food and industry. Um, so you're asking yourself, what is the most important thing? Why are we discussing filtration, for instance? If you think about food that you eat on a daily basis, all the different examples that I've given you, imagine if none of that was actually filtered. So why is filtration important? All the different ones, either it's your lung, either it's your uh, kidneys, either it's your air filter in your car, either you filtering um, uh, sunflower oil, the key thing around filtration is you need to be able to remove contaminants or impurities in the food that you guys eat. So you can imagine if you remove contaminants by virtue of you remo removing the contaminants, you're actually um, extending the shelf life. So think about if there's contaminants and impurities in a juice, for instance. Uh, after two days or three days, it's going to smell a bit funky because it still, it still has those contaminants. It means that it's not going to last you for a week or a bit longer. Um, one of the functions and why it's so important for us to filter, especially in food and beverage, we need to be able to produce quality products. Now, quality products is if I remove contaminants from my juice, from any of the things that I'm eating, it means that I have produced something of quality. At the same time, removal of contaminants will also minimize product spillages. Now you can't talk about any scientific concept or anything that you operate in industry without talking about sustainability. Sustainability is around the choices that you make in industry that could mean that if I'm using a certain type of filter aid, how do I make it sustainable? How do I make my process sustainable? Can I reuse it? Can I, re can I, can I use it in a different um, aspect? For instance, I mentioned that um, 
products like perlite, for instance, they're chemically inert. So it means that even if I were to plow it back into the environment, for instance, it will have no, um, no impact. So like an ethical, um, ethical scientist, you always have to think long term. And long term means that whatever scientific concept you apply in any of the industry that you operate in will always ensure that you sustain well, the world um, for your children. So that is my last slide. I trust you guys really enjoyed the different side of filtration. Now, if you think about, so um, if you're studying mathematics and science and you find yourself in a beverage plant, for instance, whether they're producing juice or something, you can always relate it back to everyday life. Um, so that's why I think it's, um, it's, an important, it's an important concept. I really hope you really enjoyed it and opened up uh, your avenues for different options in industry. What you, can go, um, what you can go and study is obviously mathematics and science, but when you enter industry, you can always go to different avenues, specialize in certain areas. And I have to remind you guys, this is just a portion of filtration. There is a wide range um, that is applicable in filtration. I trust you really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Wow. <coughs> that was so great, uh, Winnie. I've learned quite a lot from uh, filtration and what you have just shared with us. Mm? And that took me back to the years when, because we are years of from the years of standards, not of grades. Of grades, yes. When we used to take a filter paper. Yes. You know, put the sand, <coughs> put water in there, and then we are trying to filter the muddy water. Yes. Then it will come clear. Then there will be an argument whether are all the contaminants out there, is the water clean or is it clear, things like that. So I don't know what will the learners be heavy <coughs> when it comes to their questions. Yes. Uh, because like I said, this was from those grades of primary school, you know, when they will start to take it from the general science, you know, doing filtration and using the sand, sand soil, loom soil, clay soil, you know, yes. mix them together, then put what, what. But then when we get to the higher level now, it takes a different form, you know, like you are showing us different types of filtration and this, it doesn't limit us, you know, <coughs> people mm. can still do that. And I think this is a very great method that even experts out there needs to use it now that we have people who stay in the villages, you know, mm -hmm. we don't want kids to have this type of diseases, you know, but others, they will prefer, ah, man, let me boil water, let me do this and this and this. But we still have people who are drinking, you know, from the rivers, you know, and so on. What's your advice on that? For me, um, if we're talking wastewater specifically or contaminated water, it's a slightly different aspect because there's obviously uh, biologicals and other total dissolved solids in there. Mm. Um, the advice that they always give in primary care when they say boil it, yeah. you boil some water, you let it sit. Sits. In yeah. most of these um, samples that you see, you're actually going to see a lot of... Uh, contaminants at the bottom of uh, your boiled water which you can decant the top but I would advise if you have some sort of a method of filtering even a, fil a cloth it's better than not actually doing anything at all <laughs> yeah. but can we say under filtration we are hundred uh, percent uh, uh, safe if if you f it, okay um, mm -hmm. I think I can put it in this way different applications yeah. would require different types of filtration. All right. Different so different. if I put it like this, if you look at um, applications like pharmaceuticals, mm. they use micro or ultra filtration, which is a completely different type of study altogether. Mm. If you look at the one I presented was the one just to introduce a concept which is more physical, mm -hmm. which is something that you do. There's membrane filtration. There's um, for the different applications, there's different methods of filtration that you can use. And what is appropriate, it depends on what contaminants you are removing. Okay. 
Now, uh, uh, before I open uh, <coughs> to our learners and public members who have joined us, you know, just my last question. You spoke on uh, our traditional beer. Yes. You know, that <laughs> we have at home, you know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and yes, you know, we'll start now making umkombo tea and we'll see even ginger. You also spoke about ginger. Yes. You know, you shake it, you'll see those small particles in it. I know in some concept they would call it turbidity and so on. Yes. You know, so you won't know whether these are contaminants as a lay person or this is turbidity whatsoever, you know, things like that. How then will one be able to determine, you know, the contaminants from Mkombut? Well, you will then have to maybe take it a step further. Uh, if you do physical filtration, it will be whatever suspended solids that you get either on your filter media. Yeah. Right. If you are talking now turbid, mm. um, turbidity, now you're talking something that's dissolved in the liquid. For sure. So you would... Um, Typically, you would filter it through something they call a 0.45 micron. It's a very, 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 very fine type of filter paper. Mm. Then you will then be able to determine what sort of contaminants will be. After you filter it through that, um, you will then take that filter paper, maybe typically analyze either using um, ICP or XRF to just determine what is in there. Mm. So it depends on the type of contaminants that you're really removing. So as a lame person, if you're doing ginger beer, you're typically just removing maybe the yeast. Some guys would use um, would use some um, um, ginger root as well, which is like a, a solid particle. They just want to remove the last bit if they want a bit of flavor. And um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, that's quite interesting. I like <laughs> that. <laughs> Let me get to, to the chat box and see what questions are we having from uh our audiences our listeners that are yes. you know on different uh, platforms wherever they are and then yeah uh, see what questions they are i think i can just put one here mm -hmm. now how do i spot now uh contaminants in a beggar because we eat beggars every day <laughs> you know <laughs> during lunch time you know others you know at night things like that uh <coughs> when now that you're talking about the food and mm -hmm. beverages you know can I be suspicious when it gets to that? So when you say a burger, are you yeah, referring yeah. to like the beef patty? Whether it's beef patty, whether it's a chicken one, whether it's what, what. Remember, they put all these type of things in there, you know, and then now I'm there to eat and, you know, I don't know, you know. Well, if you look at, you know, this basic um, advice they'll give you around handling of meat. Yeah. Which is very, very different. Mm. Um if you are looking at it, you might not be able to see it, actually, to be honest with you, because mm. it could just be bacterial. Ah, okay. Um, that's the contaminant. That will then be contaminant. Yeah. But you will not filter a beef patty, for instance. For sure, yeah. Right? There's other means and methods of them making sure that it's free of contaminants, right from abattoir all the way to um, uh, them mincing it and all of it. So it's a, it's a slightly different type of concept if you think about spotting contaminants but if you see something solid on it like if you see a fly or something it's still a contaminant but it's something that you'll then be yeah. be able to see which mm. just means that they're not handling um they're not handling the food properly, properly. yes for sure but if you look at um bacterias and they, they also do filter bacterias the same way when they grow them <laughs> <laughs> that's why i say yeah. you start moving into microfiltration, membrane filtration mm. when they are removing that kind of so uh, it's all the methods of doing that it's there's different mm. yes instrumentation uh -huh. different applications will require you to use different types of methods mm. if you are filtering something ultra fine ultra fine Pharmaceuticals. Yes. Uh, pharmaceutical industries will use mainly ultra filtration mm. because you want to get right down to the bottom of less than 0.1. Sure. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I must Micron, say. yes. <laughs> I, that's, that's too So it's different. So it's it definitely. Yeah. And it's something you won't actually be able to see with your naked eye. Is it? To be honest, I mean, it's very, 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 very fine. Tiny, yeah. That's why you will then use different types of. Um, of filtration you will not filter something like that will go through um, um, filter aid just like that because a filter aid in terms of particle size is very fairly porous uh -huh. remember it's very porous 
Mm. So when you go membrane, ultrafiltration, different types of application altogether. Mm. A general question now mm -hmm. <coughs> on food. Yes. <laughs> Not specifically on the method which is filtration, things like that. Does packaging affect the food? Yes. How so? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely it does. <laughs> yeah. um, there is actually guidelines around for specific food types you used to use you, you're supposed to use specific packaging you know why i'm asking this question and looking at it because yes. <coughs> if i come to work mm -hmm. i want to use I, I want to i want to take my lunch uh, my lunch box mm -hmm. but i want to take my lunch box putting it in a plastic another one will take the lunch box putting it in a type away another one will take the lunch box putting it in this and this and so on you know so as the day continues, you know, <coughs> you'll ask yourself whether did I package my lunchbox properly? Is this the proper packaging of my lunchbox? That's what I'm getting at. You'll actually have to look at it as packaging and storage. Yeah. Right. Sure. <laughs> yes. So it's that, actually that packaging correct. plus storage. Plus storage, yes. Um, because if you are packaging in a plastic, which you're going to maybe put next to a furnace, I don't Ooh. think your lunch is going to be very exactly. fresh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> by the time you get to, um, uh, to lunchtime. And sure. also the type of plastic that you are using for your food stuff as well. Mm. Um, some types of plastics are not, are fairly contaminated depending on the type of process that is being used. Mm. That's why you'll say some, some plastics, they'll say you can put it in a microwave. The other one, you can put it in a microwave. Mm. That's already telling you we're dealing with two different types of plastics. Sure. Yeah, no, no, you are, you, I, I must agree with you there, you are correct. Is food responsible for putting in weight? <laughs> <laughs> it's the type of food. <laughs> 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 um, it's, not, um, it's not gaining yeah. weight. You know, we are structurally different as individuals. Mm. How my body composition is completely different from your body composition. Right there, what do you mean my body composition? Um, what my body is composed of or what? It could mean genetics, okay. what you are predisposed <coughs> of. If you are predisposed maybe to certain family um, um, chronic diseases, for instance, that mm. I don't have, already that means that you and I are not the same. The, the way that we react to food as well. Mm. I, for instance, might not eat bread. Because um, I struggle to process maybe gluten or... Mm. So we are, completely, we are completely different just fundamentally. Okay. Now, you need to know mm. what your body type and all of this is. Mm. I can't eat what you eat. There's also the aspect of metabolism, sure. physical activity, the types of food you're eating. Mm. Is it saturated fats? Is it more organic? Um, now I use the word loosely when I say organic. <laughs> I'm referring to is it more fruits, vegetables, that kind of things that don't have any additives in? Mm -hmm. What kind of additives are in your food? Um, how often are you eating this kind of food? Mm -hmm. So there is. So you can't. It's, you can't use a blanket statement that food makes you fat. Okay. It's the food choices mm -hmm. that people make that may perhaps would um, impact how they look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that one, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one yes. for, for people to look into. Now, another one is that, uh, is it true that uh, does bread have alcohol? Uh, bread is considered a complex carbohydrate. A complex what carbohydrate. is the core of a complex carbohydrate? Mm. Is sugars. Wow. So in certain conditions, what happens to sugar? Mm. You can ferment it. Mm. Okay. That's, <laughs> so why, that's why in most <laughs> cases you'll see the No, but when you are using combo two, there's bread there. Yeah. Yes, it's something that they use as an aid um, in mm. terms of fermentation. Yes, because it's actually a complex carb that will then um, turn into sugar. Which mm. is why some of the health warnings around it is what type of com complex carbohydrates are you eating? because they effectively turn into sugar. Not necessarily the best kind, 
um, and then they will then primary health care will then indicate to you where those type of sugars will sit in your body normally around the figure <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> then normally <laughs> around the waist yeah. uh, which then predisposes you to cardi cardiovascular issues and um, and things like that so it's you need to educate yourself firstly you need to know yourself in terms of your body okay what works for you what doesn't work for you the type of food you eat might not be the type of food that is suitable for me we can eat the same type of diet and never look the same or weigh the same or mm -hmm. <laughs> there's different there's different aspects but um in this day and age with the amount of technology science behind um how how we we feed our people um mm -hmm. it's incumbent upon everybody to really know what they're putting in their body mm. so word of advice how many times in a day must a human being eat <laughs> We it's still need to say we eat three times breakfast, lunch, dinner. Nowadays, there's something trendy. We also eat brunch, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, 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 I'll combine breakfast with lunch. At around 11 o'clock, of past 11, I'm eating. You know, is that healthy? How many times must one eat, actually? <laughs> it's now, now I, I, I have to put a disclaimer out there. I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a dietitian. Yeah. <laughs> my, um, my two cents worth. Yeah. Um, will that be it? It depends on an individual. Number one is, what are you fueling in your body? If you look at an athlete, for instance, they might not eat three big meals, yeah. but they will eat frequently because of how they're expanding their energy, how much they're using their energy throughout the day. Okay. Right. Mm. So he might eat two or three times more than you, mm -hmm. but he's eating frequently and he's using it. And you might eat one meal a day and you think, aye, this is very less food. But then you eat and you fall asleep on the couch. Okay. You see. <laughs> so you can't determine and also obviously your metabolic rate um food is around how much you're expanding and what you put in you're supposed to be able to use mm. if it's excess it's gonna stay in your body yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so um <laughs> the number of time it depends mm. because if what you mm. what you're looking at but it's not necessarily the number of times it's what are you eating mm. you can eat 20 times but if you uh, if you're having a carrot stick it might not have the same impact if you're having a burger 20 times a day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you see what I mean? Because so what mm. are you eating? Mm. What are you eating when you say you're eating? Because one will be guideline by <coughs> to say there is lunch, like I said. Mm -hmm. There is breakfast. There is dinner. Yes. Does that necessarily imply that that's how the metabolism goes. That's how food can go. That's how I'm channeled as a human being to say, there's breakfast, there's lunch, there's what, what. And I will choose only to say, Mark, there is brunch, you know. There's I'm done for the day, for, for, for 24 hours, I'm okay. There's very different methods, depends on your metabolic rate. Yeah. I mean, these days, there's concept around fasting. You see, yes. Um, some people fast for six hours and they only eat one meal. And that's how maybe the their metabolism work. Mm. Um, I may not be able to fast for 12 hours if I'm climbing up and down the stairs in a chemical plant. Because yeah. I will need yeah. the energy for, for different. But somebody can fast for 12 hours. Maybe they're sitting perhaps behind a table, mm. uh, behind a laptop the whole day. So mm. it's different. What is your lifestyle? Mm. What works for you? What is the impact health-wise mm. on all the numbers your doctor tells you you need to know mm. for your body? But I'm glad that you mentioned the issue of filtration and so on, which is a guideline to the healthy habit, you know, to say <coughs> this filtration and removing these contaminants, yes. you know, getting this thing, then you get to exactly what you are looking for with what you are presenting to us about mm -hmm. filtration and types of filtration yes. that you are using, which are the methods you know, in short, to the learners. I hope they've gained a lot.
And uh, I think from my side, looking at the time that you have been with us here, mm. you know, I think you have hammered all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I really <laughs> clar clarify yeah, And I think it them. doesn't end here. If, if, if anyone is looking for you to say, ah, man, word of advice, we are having this day in our institution and so on, and what, what, where do we get you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, social media, <laughs> no, <laughs> but um, I think um, you're probably going to be the best in terms of link with the partnership that we have with Saibono. Okay. I will then be able to address mm. and assist any way that I'm able to. Yeah. No, I'm glad you mentioned that. So if there's anyone who would like to like, yes, with Makati, we need, <laughs> please make sure that you do that via Kolani Namek. <laughs> Not straight to her. She just said it straight that you need to <laughs> her, her expertise. Let it be Kolani. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> I, I still need to gain some traction on uh, uh, the social media thing. Yeah. We come from the 80s, so <laughs> it's we not are the difficult. Same <laughs> Eish, me, I'm from the 70s, I'm sure. Thank yeah. you very much for blessing us, you know, and for blessing the learners, for sharing with them, you know, this little that we had for them, that they must take it upon themselves. So when they are opening their books, when they study their books, doing that filtration, trying to understand, you know, the mobility of the solution in removing the contaminants that no, at least they get the clear understanding. And you have just said it clearly to them that what they are doing in the classroom is just the beginning. There's so much that they will be faced with as they run with their academia in their careers. Thank you very much. And please, I hope this was not for the last time that we are with Saibono. You'll bring us more with your developments that you come across in your own institution. From my side, ladies and gentlemen, that was Makati Wini Rasifudi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joining us, giving us her ideas on food and beverages through Crystal Solutions. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of our Speak to a Scientist program. Hope to meet you again with more of the topics that we are having on Speak to a Scientist. Thank you. Thank you.